10.6 Natural Service Functions of Cyclones Cyclones bring a lot of precipitation, sometimes too much, but during drought or low moisture conditions, the precipitation can be a relief. Even when there is associated flooding, the standing water on the land is important for groundwater recharge. Temperature distribution is also a wonderful natural service function of cyclones, especially when moving warm temps from the tropics towards the poles. Also, wind dispersal of plant, animal, and microorganisms is useful. A nice demonstration of this is in the picture to the right. The little island in Fiji, very little, is covered in plants and surrounded by corals. How did they get there? The answer, my friend, is blown in the wind and the waves, blown by the wind. This phenomenon also occurs on the mainland. It's just not as obvious or as easily proved. Cyclones can also really mix waters up with all that wave action, which can increase the nutrient content in the water. The nutrients can come from deep waters where not much grows, but a lot of dead material accumulates or the nutrients can come from sediments washed into the waters from the land. Either way, the nutrients result in blooms of life, often starting with plankton, and going on up the food chain. When plankton are thriving, they provide a feast for everything else. And that brings us to the last item on our natural service function list. Rejuvenate ecosystems. As any time any ecosystem is damaged, there is a flurry of regrowth due to the new space that was just made available. In forests, a downed tree is a chance for a new tree to grow. And if you are familiar with forests, you know that usually more than one tree tries to fill the gap. Same goes for other ecosystems, including coral reefs. Can you think of other natural service functions? There are more. You just need to make sure you explain how these effects of cyclones are beneficial to us. 10.7 Human Interaction with Cyclones It's on the increase. More people, and in particular, more people in coastal areas prone to coastal cyclones directly increases human interaction with cyclones. And with more people and their associated structures in coast cyclone prone areas, there is more damage. And as these areas are often nice, or at least expensive places to live, the costs, the costs to fix <laughs> the, um, the cyclone damage has also increased by more than just normal inflation rates. The images to the right are before and after shots of the coastline where Hurricane Rita hit land. Damage takes money to fix. Hopefully no one living in this area was damaged. People also take money to fix and sometimes can't be fixed. Sad. On the more academic side of things, the human interaction or at least awareness of cyclones has increased as weather tracking has improved. Prior to satellite imaging, many cyclones formed and dissipated without anyone being the wiser for it. Now we can watch a tropical disturbance from off the coast of Africa and hold our collective breaths as it intensifies to a depression, storm, and then hurricane that could hit land on the western Atlantic coasts and cause devastation. It could also end up not causing any devastation, but us humans would be aware of it. Another item that is increasing the human interaction with cyclones is climate change. We, as a human race, are on both sides of this interaction with cyclones. We are both exacerbating the cause of cyclones and are affected by the increased cyclone hazard. Climate change is quite a bit our fault with releasing tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The resulting warmer oceans are leading to more or more intense tropical cyclones. Extra tropical cyclones are also on the rise in frequency or intensity. Climate change is also causing the sea level to rise, which makes the cyclone-related storm surges more damaging.
10.8, Minimizing the Effects of Cyclones. Primary mitigation strategy is to accurately predict and forecast the cyclone hazard. Other mitigation strategies are covered under adjustments to cyclones. The following section. Forecasts and warnings. The goal is to give the public enough time to prepare and evacuate. The U.S. National Hurricane Center, NHC, uses information from weather satellites, hurricane hunter aircraft, Doppler radar, weather buoys, reports from ships, and computer models to detect, forecast, and predict hurricanes. Remember, a forecast is a statement of probability of a hazard occurring during a certain time interval, often with a probability percentage. And a prediction has a date, time, and magnitude of the event. So, the National Hurricane Center can and does issue hurricane watches and warnings. A watch in the U.S. is issued when the hurricane is likely to strike within 36 hours. And a warning is issued when a hurricane is likely to strike in 24 hours or less. Hurricane forecasting tools include weather satellites, hurricane hunter aircraft, Doppler radar, weather buoys, reports from ships, and computer models. Weather satellites can see storms develop way out over the ocean but can't tell some important information such as wind speed and moisture content, i.e. rain. So another tool is used for that. A hurricane hunter aircraft actually fly through the storm taking measurements of wind speed and precipitation and temperature, etc. They can start collecting data about 1,600 miles out to sea in the Atlantic. The picture to the right is a drop sound, which collects meteorological information. The drop sound is dropped from the Hurricane Hunter aircraft and collects and sends the data as it falls through the tropical cyclone. Doppler radar can obtain similar information once the storm is about 200 miles off the coast. Weather buoys and ships also collect and relay similar information at their locations. Lots of information, which means this is a good situation for a computer model. Generally, a global forecast model and or similar models are used. The models spit out predictions for up to 16 days in advance. However, the farther out the prediction, the less accurate it is, of course. Generally, predictions further out than seven days are not relied on. So data continues to be collected and models continue to be run almost until, and sometimes after, the hurricane strikes. Way to go, meteorologists! Woo Storm surge predictions are based on wind speed, fetch, and water depth. The water depth as well as coastlines have been mapped in great detail by LIDAR, light detection and ranging. It's an airborne laser surveying technique. The known drop in atmospheric pressure also helps in predicting the height of a storm surge. All this information is carefully thrown into a computer model, such as SLOSH, which stands for Sea, Land, and Overland Surges from Hurricanes. Some good work was put into making that acronym SLOSH. And another computer modeling program called ADCIRC, which stands for Advanced Circulation, a critical component of determining the height and extent on the storm surge is time due to tides. A high tide versus a low tide can make a great deal of difference, especially in areas with large tide fluctuations, such as along some parts of the New England coast. With all these variables and the fact that hurricane conditions change constantly, I am amazed that the storm surge predictions are usually accurate within 20%, which that's just a few feet of error. Yeah, if my house was being flooded, the difference of a few feet would be important to me. But in determining evacuation zones, accuracy within a few feet is usually good enough. Image to the right is the hurricane storm surge flooding associated with Hurricane Rita. Looks pretty soggy.